Good evening, good afternoon to everybody. Good day. My name's Halsey Snow. I'm with the main chapter of the Sierra Club. And I want to welcome you to this uh, first webinar in our series called Rivers, Dams, and Climate Change that we're putting on this fall. Uh, the, the group that is hosting this, NICAPA, the New England Canadian Provinces Alliance, is a Sierra Club grassroots team of local and Canadian members um, who are, you know, working to educate the public and policymakers around the misconceptions surrounding hydropower as clean, green, and renewable resource. So we're working on mega dams and rivers, and tonight's theme is let the rivers run free. And we have three speakers, Meg Sheehan, Dan Kuniers, and Jay Hesse. So Meg is going to be our first speaker. Meg Sheehan is a public interest environmental lawyer from Plymouth, Massachusetts. She's currently coordinator of the Community Land and Water Coalition, which is based in southeastern Massachusetts. She served formerly as the coordinator for NAMRA, which is the North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance, and Cape Cod Baywatch. She's also been an assistant attorney general for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and a staff attorney at the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority. She holds a BA in economics from Colgate University and a JD from Boston College Law School. She specializes in litigation in state and administrative law in the areas of clean water, forests, climate, and land protection. And she has co-founded several grassroots campaigns for the protection of rivers and land, and has served on various boards, including Earthrise Law Center, Northeast Wilderness Trust, Wildlands Trust of Southeastern Massachusetts, the Jones River Watershed Association, and the Massachusetts chapter of the Nature Conservancy, as well as the North American Mega Dams Resistance Alliance. Thank you for being with us, Megan. I'm gonna turn it over to you. And while Meg is talking, I will share her slides. Uh, are you hearing Meg? Because I'm not. I'm not hearing her, no. Did we lose her? Yep, I think we have. So perhaps we'll just have to wait until she gets to a place where there's better reception. And we'll go on to our second speaker, Dan. Dan Kuzniers yes. has served as the Water Resources Program Manager for the Penobscot Indian Nation since 1993, developing an understanding of cultural lifeways and values while integrating these into scientific studies. In this capacity, he oversees water projects for the tribe, including monitoring water quality throughout the Penobscot River watershed and tribal territories. And that's in Maine, in case any of you are not from Maine, wondering where that is. Uh, also operation of the tribe's own analytical laboratory, studies of toxic contaminants in fish, wildlife, and plants used by tribal members, and studies related to hydro dam removal. He participates in many permitting, licensing, and regulatory proceedings that affect tribal resources. He served as a tribal representative on the National Tribal Water Council, Tribal PFAS Workgroup, and EPA Tribal Science Council. He's got a BS in wildlife biology from the University of Vermont and has attended graduate school in wildlife biology at the University of Maine. Thank you and welcome, Dan. Thank you, Halsey. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides here. Yeah. Can you see those okay? Yes. Okay. 
So um, as mentioned, I work for the Penobscot Indian Nation and the Penobscot River watershed is um, the homeland of the Penobscot people. And so this, this watershed has been historically the, of great importance to the tribe and, and still is. You know, they really kind of refer to the Penobscot River and all of its tributaries as kind of like the I-95 road network, but they would use the river for um, navigating by canoe and, and to get into their hunting and fishing grounds. And so it's been used for uh, for sustenance fishing practices, which are still carried out today, for gathering wild foods such as fiddlehead ferns, uh, mushrooms, uh, medicines, uh, for gathering plants that are important for uh, culturally significant things such as building birch bark canoes, basket making, um, the tribe hunts on these lands. So the, my program is within the Department of Natural Resources. So the mission of our program is to protect, enhance, and restore water quality and aquatic resources and related aquatic ecosystems of Penobscot Nation's territories so that tribal members can fully carry out tribal cultural cult practices and life ways. So largely what I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, in relation to the Penobscot River Restoration Project and other, other restoration work that's going on in the Penobscot. Uh, so this diagram here or this map shows you um, a, most of the dams on in the Penobscot watershed. And this, this map was generated a little while ago, but we're going to focus. You can see there's there are a lot of dams in the watershed. Um, and then if you look at the area that says project area. So that project area is um, pointing to the Penobscot River Restoration Project. So this project in, entailed um, purchases, coming up with a, a, um, a settlement agreement. And then um, the Penobscot River Restoration Trust was formed and it purchased the Howland Milford Great Works and our, it, the Howland Great Works and VZ dams. And uh, then they removed um, the Great Works dam, the VZ dam. And with the money that came from the, the sale of that, there was additional capacity put in at remaining dams within the Penobscot watershed. And um, the the great for those who are not familiar with the Penobscot River, the Great Works and the VZ dams were located downstream of the reservation, and now that those are removed, um, the fish passage, like the Atlantic salmon that would get captured and that get used for the purposes of helping to restore them, so you know they get sent, the adults get sent off to the Craig Book National Fish Hatchery. And the uh, they're spawned there to have uh, fry and smolts to do to supplement and have a, a stocking program to help restore those fish. And so, with the removal of the Great Works and VZ dams, there was a, a fish uh, elevator um, that was put in that was installed at the Milford Dam to be able to improve passage for fish, but also to be able to uh, capture the Atlantic salmon as needed to help with that restoration program. And then the other part of the project on the Howland Dam, that's on the, it's right where the confluence of the Piscataquis River meets the Penobscot. There's lots of Atlantic salmon um, spawning habitat in the Piscataquis River. And so that dam, um, the folks that live in that community we're really hard set against removing the dam. But so what was done is a, um, a bypass channel was engineered around the dam. So no matter what the water levels are, there's always free flowing river that goes around the dam so fish can access upstream habitat. So this diagram here shows you on the left, um, prior to the restoration project, what the access looked like for sea run fish coming into the Penobscot River. So 
the area um, designated it's that's shown in kind of pink colored uh, border that's where the habitat or, or that's the only habitat that the rest um, sea run fish were able to get to after the removal of the VZ and Great Works Dam and that bypass channel that was created on the uh, Piscataquis River, the Howland Dam, it significantly improved access for sea run fish for nearly 2,000 miles of habitat. And so these species include Atlantic salmon, which are listed, listed uh, as endangered for blueback herring, uh, alewives, uh, shad, uh, American eel, sea lamprey, striped bass, rainbow smelt, tom cod, uh, shad, and um, so now those species are are able to get into much more of the historic habitat. So here I just have some some pictures to kind of show you some of the places. If you haven't been to them before, this is the Great Works Impoundment. So this would be in the area behind the dam. On the left, you can see what it looked like before the dam was removed. And then on the right, what it looked like after removal. And this is downstream, same general area, but downstream of the dam. The photos on the left show you what that area looked like immediately downstream of the dam before it was removed and on the right, what it looked like after the removal. And then here, this is the VZ impoundment, which is a very long, deep impoundment. Um, this, the diagram on the upper left shows you what it looked like before the dam came out, and then uh, what it looks like now after dam removal. So historically, the Penobscot River would uh, had runs of probably around 75 to 100,000 adults that would return each year. And it's the largest, it hosts the largest run of Atlantic salmon left in the United States. So it's kind of the last strong. Now, if you want to use up the goat yogurt, you can. So it's, it represents the last stronghold for our efforts to try to restore Atlantic salmon to the United States. And so this diagram on the bottom shows you kind of what the historical runs have looked like for each year. And so, you know, we had some pretty good years kind of back in the nothing like what they were historically. Um, but, you know, we had some runs up around four, four thousand, close to 4,000 in the uh, early 80s. And then they really, uh, you know, they kind of might vary from year to year, uh, but they really went down. And so now we're we're returning approximately, um, you know, kind of in the ballpark of a thousand to fifteen hundred each year. So nowhere is where where they need to be in order to sustain the population. So the recovery of Atlantic salmon uh, likely depends upon the return of, of other he of healthy populations of other diadromous or migratory fish, such as sea herring, or I'm sorry, river herring, sea lamprey, American shad. These species go out to the ocean and live most of their lives there, and then they get they grow there. And they have all these marine derived nutrients that are now stored in their bodies. And then when they come in in the springtime to spawn, they bring those nutrients with them into the spawning waters. So they're depositing their eggs. And then uh, most of these species uh, will also, as adults, they after they spawn, they will return to the, uh, to the ocean. Not all of them, but, but most of them, certainly the, the Atlantic salmon do. But they bring these nutrients, which are really important for that whole ecosystem because they um, provide nutrients that go into the water, which then feed the aquatic insects. And then that abundant population of aquatic insects is now available for the small salmon and, and alewives and other species that are growing um, before they head back out to sea. So one of the most remarkable things we've seen in the Penobscot has been the recovery of uh, river herring. So river herring are uh, uh, alewives and blueback herring kind of combined 
They're referred to as river herring. So prior to the removals of the VZ and Great Works dams up in, around before 2014, there were no, there were no river herring that were able to make it uh, up into the river beyond Milford. And now this past couple of years in 23 and 24, we've returned over 5.5 million river herring. If you've also recovered um, this past year, we had about 3,500 sea lamprey, about 1,100 American shad. And we also see a lot of striped bass. Um, they typically don't go beyond the dam. They, they kind of chase a lot of the fish up and, and hang out below the dam uh, at Milford. But we've noticed that the, the size of these um, striped bass has really increased over the last few years, probably because of all the abundant food that they're getting in that area. There are also a lot, in addition to the dam removals, there are loads of Atlantic salmon restoration works going on. So there's projects underway where uh, fry, which are the really small ones, are being um, stocked or released into good habitat in the hopes that they will uh, return back to those places as adults. And then we also, um, there's a project called Maine for, or Salmon for Maine's Future, which is raising uh, Atlantic salmon of Penobscot River strain, raising to them, them to adult stage, and then returning the, and then releasing them in good habitat. So, and some of this is on the East branch of the Penobscot, as well as on some tr tributaries that are on Penobscot nation lands. And they've had really good success with this kind of work uh, in the Maritimes of Canada. And in addition, there's lots of work being done on restoring connectivity. So there are a lot of uh, small dams that are being removed and replaced with sort of natural fishways. A lot of work on culverts, uh, bridges, and other kinds of stream crossings that impair uh, the connectivity of the fish to be able to return to their uh, habit, their spawning habitat. I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but I just wanted to show this really quick video of what the L-wife return looks like if people have never seen this. Can you see the that video of the yes. male wives? Great. So this is at Leonard's Mills. This is a um, Blackman Stream, which is a tributary that comes into the Penobscot a little ways below the uh, Milford Dam. And uh, we just have these, you know, huge numbers of of L wives that are now able to get back. Wow. This usually happens. The peak of this usually occurs in around mid May. And uh, it's really spectacular to see. I would, and, and a lot of streams in the Penobscot watershed now look like this. So I would highly encourage folks that are here from Maine to, to go check that out. Uh, I will also just very briefly cruise over some other stuff. The Penobscot Nation, we do a lot of water quality monitoring. So we did a bunch of work on looking at the changes that occurred bef between before and after the dams were removed. And so we've definitely seen some improve, slight improvements in dissolved oxygen after the dams were removed. Uh, we also saw, there are a lot of changes that have occurred, but we also have seen some of the major discharges like paper mills here in the, in the Penobscot River have closed. And so there are water quality improvements that have happened that are not necessarily due to the dam removal. So you have to kind of statistically try to tease out which is due to the dam removal versus just the improvements in water quality from other, other things. We've also seen a big change in a lot of the benthic macroinvertebrates, the aquatic insects that live in the community, that live at these sites before and after the dams were removed. And another thing that we saw measuring uh, water temperature, uh, we saw that after the dams were removed, you, what you, uh, you saw was a, a change in the, um, the range of temperature 
So the daily max in men changed during the summertime um, to uh, reflect more what you'd see in free flowing habitat. And so what that really means is um, when in the summertime, when the water is really hot in an impounded area, it takes, there's not a lot of interaction between the water, uh, the deeper waters and the air temperature. So the, the water temperature kind of stays similar, kind of pretty um, similar from top to bottom. But when you remove the dams, what we saw was that you would see at night, the water temperature would get a lot cooler. It would get warm during the daytime, but it would get cool at night. And that's important for, uh, for things that cold water species such as salmon, because they need to have that little break. They can tolerate some uh, warmer temperatures, but they need some changes uh, or some colder water to recover from. And then the other thing I just wanted to uh, quickly go over was um, it's, it's, you know, there's still a lot of long ways to go. And I wanted to talk about the West branch of the Penobscot River. Uh, there's a lot of habitat for these species of fish in the West branch. However, there is no fish passage to go for them to be able to get there. So the dams that are that are on the West Branch are not allowing migration of fish to to go uh, go through there. So there's two major projects that are currently going on um, that are going through FERC relicensing. So there is the uh, Penobscot Mills project, which is the the lower one shown on this map in the kind of bottom right, and then the upper left the Ripogenus project, and so. These projects, I know I'm kind of running out of time here, but there's a, there's a, they, it's really important for people to get involved in those projects because FERC relicensing only happens about once every 30 years. So it's really important to get conditions put in those licenses to, um, to help with the fisheries that we're trying to restore and to get good water quality because you have to wait another 30 years or so before we come back around to that again. So um, a lot, like, as I mentioned, a lot of the habitat to the West Branch is blocked by, by dams. Um, there's area, now that we have all these fish returning after the Penobscot River Restoration Project, um, it would be really good for them to be able to get up into the West Branch area. We also have some areas um, that have been dewatered over previous licensing of those facilities. So I'm going to just quickly show you um, here. This is the this is the on the left hand side. That's the former West Branch of the Penobscot River, but it was rerouted back in the late 1800s to go through one of the paper mills. And so that's what the West Branch looks like. And they refer to it as the back channel, which sort of sounds like a, um, you know, a ditch on the side of the road type of thing. And the, a few a couple of years ago, there were, um, they had to do some work at one of the dams and they were able to actually release what would have been more realistic flows that you can see on the right hand side. And so that's the right, the photo on the right shows you what the West Branch um, or what they refer to as the back channel really should look like. And there's a lot of good habitat in there for a variety of species. Hmm. And I think I'm gonna stop with that because my time is about up. Thank you, Dan. We're gonna take about five minutes for any uh, questions now and there'll be more time um, after all the speakers for more questions and discussion. And so I'm going to turn to uh, Becky Bartovic for the yes. questions. Hi, the first question came from Roger Wheeler. How much of the flow is regulated by upstream reservoirs or impounded sure. lakes? So um, a lot of the dams in the Penobscot watershed are what are referred to as run of river dams. So they're supposed to let out the kind of the same amount of water that's coming in, but there's some leeway that's provided there. The West branch of the Penobscot has quite a bit of storage uh, 
the dams that are there do have storage and they do um, manipulate those water levels. So, so yes, there's, there's quite a bit of an effect by those upstream dams and the concerns about that, especially with climate change and we get uh, years where we, where we have, you know, really warm temperatures or we don't have a lo lot of water uh, we have concerns about, you know, that that should be kind of factored into the relicensing conditions. Um, I have a question myself, since I don't see any more in the chat. I want to know for those two relicensings, uh, is, was there funding that came, I, I think there was recent funding that came from the um, congressional delegation or from Congress, um, and are, is, are those funds um, leveled at both of those dam uh FERC dam uh relicensings I'm not sure what you're referring to yeah well, there's that, that, there's a lot of money that's come in for helping to remove some smaller dams and and, and improving fish passage but to my knowledge there's nothing that's going towards those dams Okay, so so our activism on those two dams is still when what is the deadline for commenting on the FERC? Uh, um, it'll be going on for the next probably the next two or three years. Okay, thank you. Any other questions at this point? If anybody has a question, you can raise your hand, or we'll go on to our next speaker. And I'll just check and see if Meg is in a position to be able to talk with us now. I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Cliff, go I, ahead. I, for some reason, my hand isn't being raised. And also I did post two, two to three questions in the chat and Becky said there were no other questions. So I don't know what's going on. Do you have a question now, Cliff? Yes, I do. Go ahead. Uh, Dan, you know, in your graphs, you showed a real, you showed a gain in the, in the Atlantic fish population. And then it started to drop off in the 1970s again. Okay. And I was wondering if you're aware, it was about in the 1970s that uh, many dams, large dams in the subarctic region came into operation and those dams are so large that they store and, and catch a lot of the sediments that are supposed to come get into the Arctic Ocean and then filter down the Atlantic coast. And, I, and I'm noticing that your fish populations dropped off, maybe, possibly, could that have to do with the lack of nutrition Be mm. starting in the 70s and running right through? It's really hard to know, you know, there's so many factors that are, you know, when the fish get out to the ocean, there are so many factors between uh, that can be affecting their populations between, you know, climate change, uh, harvesting in uh, Greenland, um, predation, you know, there's, there's, once they get out into the ocean, it's really kind of hard to know. So it, it could be, it could be a factor. Yeah, I know, I noticed the currents come down from the Arctic Ocean. And if the Arctic Ocean is losing considerable amount of nutrition, that could affect fish, fish populations mm. greatly. Mm. Okay. That should any be other, Yep, we're gonna ask uh, any other questions and then we're gonna move on to uh, Dan, I think. I mean, to sorry, to Jay. Thank you, Cliff. All right then. Hopefully Meg will be in a position to join us when she gets to where we're going. So, Becky? She she texted me. She's just uh, going to join us in a bit. She The train, she couldn't get good service on the train. So she'll yep. be with in a couple minutes. So that's a okay. good. Okay. okay. All right. Our next speaker is Jay Hesse. Jay is the Director of Biological Services for the Nez Perce Tribe's Department of Fisheries Resources Management, and he's worked for the tribe for 29 years. He helps manage the tribe's research division, a team of over 40 staff working on fish population status, trends monitoring, and hatchery evaluation. 
His recent work assignments focus on hydro system operations, including development of the 2019 to 2021 spill operations agreement. Mr. Hesse has expertise in anadrom. You're going to have to correct me on that one, Jay. I can't pronounce that. Anadromous. Anadromous. Thank you. Fish population dynamics, hatchery effectiveness research, strategic planning, and multi entity collaboration. He provides technical and management representation for the Nez Perce tribe in multiple Columbia River Basin Fisheries co management forums. He served as the president of the Idaho chapter of the American Fisheries Society from 2016 to 2017 and is the recipient of the John Robertson Award for Outstanding Leadership. Thanks for joining us, Jay, and take it away. Great. I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about the Pacific Northwest and the fisheries management efforts uh, throughout the Columbia Basin with some specific emphasis on the Snake River Basin uh, that's in the heartland of uh, the Nez Perce or Nimipu people. So just, just uh, to give you a little bit of glimpse of, of some of the uh, landscapes in that Snake River Basin, this picture is of the Sawtooth Mountains in central Idaho and of the, the lakes there that historically supported really robust sockeye populations of salmon. And those populations are just barely hanging on at this point. So uh, on the other side of the United States, on the West Coast is uh, the Columbia River Basin. Uh, Seattle is, is up here in the Puget Sound area. And uh, so the Columbia Basin uh, is the drainage for uh, really five different states, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, uh, a little bit of Montana, even some Nevada and a chunk of Canada. The Snake Basin that, that I'll be focusing on is, is here in uh, Northeast Oregon, Southeast Washington, and, and a big chunk of, of Idaho. Historically, uh, the Snake Basin uh, supported, well, the Columbia Basin as a whole uh, was estimated to have returns of anadromous fish, multiple stocks of salmon and steelhead, lamprey, of 10 to 16 million fish returning historically. And, and that was a driver both ecologically and socially for uh, Native American tribes. What we'll be talking about uh, here is really uh, four dams that are across the lower Snake River. They're all in uh, Southeast Washington. Uh, there are four more dams in the lower Columbia uh, that the, that anadromous fish from the Snake Basin will still have to, to deal with. There are other dams in the upper Snake Basin that uh, do not have uh, anadromous fish passage currently. So this, this watershed, the Columbia as a whole, and the Snake Basin as a higher percentage was really the most productive Chinook habitat in the world. And, and that connection uh, is really a central part of the, the ecosystem. So it's bigger than just fish, it's bigger than just tribal members. Uh, it is uh, estimated that 135 species uh, of birds and mammals and insects uh, thrive because of the marine drive nutrients that came back into the snake basin uh, from those anadromous fish returns. I want to highlight a little bit of the uniqueness of the Snake River Basin and, and how that is some buffer or resilience in climate change. While I'll talk a lot about the status of salmon and steelhead being really dire, it is unique uh, about the intactness of the habitat in the upper reaches of the Snake Basin. So uh, you can see the states here and the, the major tributaries uh, to the Snake Basin. But what I want you to pay attention to is the colors that overlay those tributaries. Uh, the, the darker green is areas that are wilderness areas, designated wilderness areas in the lower, 40 snake, uh, for lower 48 states. And so, you know, pristine habitat with some impacts because of reduced marine nutrients and and a little bit of, of legacy mining, but for the most part, this is, is pristine habitat. The lighter green is 
federally managed lands. And so very little development uh, within those, still human activity uh, you know, throughout most of that, but uh, no major population uh, centers within those. And so as you think about the, the, the coverage of most of this basin, it is a, over federally managed and, and or wilderness area landscapes. And that provides really the coldest and most un undisturbed habitat in the Pacific Northwest. It's also high elevation and been estimated to be uh, the most resilient to, to climate change effects, meaning that a lot of that is at higher elevations, elevations above 5,000 feet. And, and those elevations are estimated to remain in snowpack uh, driven uh, hydrograph. So the below 5,000 feet or even below 6,000 feet estimates are will switch from snow driven runoff to more rain events, but a major chunk of this basin will remain intact with snow driven hydrology. So getting fish to this, this good quality habitat is really important. That therein lies the issue with these four dams that are highlighted in the upper left hand corner of the screen. Um, just a quick tidbit about uh, the Nez Perce, who I have been employed for for 30 years now. Um, I, I'm not sure there's a difference between 29 and 30 after, after a while, but uh, the Nez Perce or Nimipu are, are just indistinguishable from the fish that inhabit the Pacific Northwest. It is the way of life, a cornerstone for, for that tribal culture. In 1855, uh, the tribe entered into uh, a treaty with the United States, and part of that treaty reserved the right, it's not established, but it reserved the right uh, to take fish at all usable and custom places uh, throughout uh, kind of the Nez Perce historic lands. And you can see that that spans, you know, a huge area of the Pacific Northwest, and, and I'm going to set aside all of the history in terms of current reservation boundaries and, and management area, but um, with that reserved right to harvest comes the responsibility to manage. And thus my employment and uh, employment for about 175 employees within the tribe's fisheries department at this time. So in a fisheries management sense, we, we follow a fairly linear process that's circular in, in its application, but it starts with setting goals assessing the status of fish relative to those goals. They never match up. So then we look for reasons why or limiting factors. Uh, we look for ways to, to take action to resolve those limiting factors. We evaluate the effectiveness of those actions and then we adjust because nothing ever goes as planned. So if we follow that cycle and setting goals, there was a collaborative process that happened here in the Columbia Basin in 2018 to 2020. It was led by the National Marine Fishery Service and called the Columbia Basin Partnership. It was an effort that included sovereign entities, both at the federal, state, and tribal level, but it also includes stakeholders that were non-sovereigns uh, from fishing groups, agriculture, transportation, ports, a real diversity of folks that really defined on an abundance based, you know, how many fish coming back to the Snake Basin do we really want to have uh, to, to be managing for. So that set our goals for what's considered healthy and harvestable or healthy and abundant. Those goals that were established are well below the historic levels, anywhere from five to 31% of what was estimated to be historically. The historic estimates for, for five stocks of anadromous fish are, are shown here as the top portion of the green bars. So for spring, summer Chinook, the historic estimate was a thousand or a million of those adults coming back to the Snake Basin historically. Well, the healthy and harvestable goal that's been established now is actually 235,000 coming back to a, a point in the Snake Basin. <clears throat> and so you can see, you know, where we've set those goals. The black dots are the current abundance of where we're at, right at the bottom. We are just really on the precipice of, of extirpation or extinction. How do I communicate that to the rest of the world? I've really struggled with that in terms of numbers and what a million fish means and what does uh, extinction mean? And so I, I've gone back to the simplicity of a, a simple record, report card that we all had in, in our K through 12 experience. And so if you think of historical levels as being a, an A plus and extinction 
uh, as F, um, you can you can kind of put together a, a quick uh, visual of where we're at, and and it's not a pretty picture. So uh, spring summer Chinook are at an E, and really on a high risk of extinction. So are steelhead and lamprey. Uh, sockeye and coho are really functionally extinct or totally extinct in terms of coho. They're only in the Snake Basin because the tribe reintroduced them through a hatchery program. Sturgeon uh, are degraded and, and barely hanging on. If I look at these and, and get in, into these in a little more detail, you get into pictures like this, which uh, e either get folks in the science world all excited or put the rest of the world, which is the majority, to sleep. So this is just a time series of spring, summer Chinook, um, both wild origin and hatchery coming back to the Snake Basin, and, and then what the current abundance of those are relative to our goals. And, and they're pretty low. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for just a second. And, and highlight this in another way that's more relatable to me. So I, I have a fix on coffee. And, and so whether it's your local Starbucks or some other thing, a 16 ounce uh, uh, cup of coffee or mocha represents, uh, when it's full, when you get it from your barista, represents the historic abundance of spring, summer Chinook coming back to the Snake River Basin. Okay, so that would be a, represent a million fish coming back. For the recent past, for and this year in particular, natural origin or wild spring summer Chinook coming back to the Snake Basin was 7,500. So if you put that into milliliters, uh, just to appease the Canadian crowd of, of this and not go, uh, that's 3.7 milliliters and, and fits into to that syringe there. Okay, so if I put that into the cup that was you know supposed to be full and what was historic, you know, what you have now, if you could see that, doesn't even cover the bottom of the cup and actually fits in the palm of my hand without getting my keyboard wet on the computer. Okay, that's not exactly thirst quenching. So we are on the edge of extirpation here and, and looking for ways to change that. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. And so, <clears throat> What we really are, instead of measuring success to those uh, goals that the Columbia Basin Partnership uh, set, we're, we're actually measuring the reality of failure. And failure is extinction. And, and so this is a quasi-extinction threshold. It's a conservation biology metric commonly defined as 50 or fewer natural origin fish returning to a population in four consecutive years. So this is the Snake Basin. Uh, the black line is uh, the area where the Nez Perce tribe has sole use of those uh, fish and access uh, relative to other uh, tribes and makes up a major part of, of, of Idaho. But the, the colored populations are individual populations throughout the Snake Basin. There are 35 of those. Uh, currently, 6 or 17 percent of those populations have had 50 or fewer natural order spawners in the last few years. If we take and predict out where we're gonna be at by 2028, we're estimating that 57% of those populations are gonna be at or below 50 or fewer. So we're really, really at the bottom of the barrel at this point. So what do you do? You know, We look at limiting factors and this is collaborative work that's looked at uh, the threats to those populations and they're, vet, they're diverse and they've changed over time. But the largest single factor is related to hydrosystem, both from direct and indirect effects uh, that those fish face. Um, and there are other factors along the way. So how do we change or address these limiting factors? Well, we've done a bunch of this over the 50 to 75 years that the dams have been in place in the Snake Basin. We've put fish on barges to transport them around uh, the 325 miles of once was riverine environment that's now reservoirs. We've restricted harvest. We've put predator control actions on. We've changed dams and, and how they operate and how they're formed. We've changed how water flows and how much. Uh, and we've done a bunch of tributary habitat. None of that has achieved success. So here are the pictures that kind of go with, with all of those. So, <clears throat> okay, so major work trying to solve those limiting factors that's not getting this. 
When we really look at the impacts that dams have had relative to all of those, it's extreme. So the four lower snake dams impound about 140 miles of once was riverine uh, habitat. It's now hot and very slow moving. Um, that decreases the condition of or health of fish. It reduces the food and, and habitat that they have to rear end. It increases the predators, both in numbers and species, including invasive species. What once took one to two days for the juveniles to migrate down through that river, a stretch of river now takes 10 to 30 days. Um, there is delayed effects that occur when those fish get to the ocean and there's impacts for those fish when they're coming back upstream. So hydro system, according to the National Marine Fishery Service, the federal agency deemed to manage these fish is the largest threat to, to these fish. Uh, there's been recent, there's been work over decades uh, doing this, but two recent reports in 2022, one by the NOAA Fisheries on what it was going to take to rebuild salmon into healthy and harvestable, and then another pa paper looking at the effects of dams itself. Out of those two publications, there are over 200 uh, papers that are cited, and they conclude that it's going to take a suite of actions, multiple types of things, habitat restoration, uh, hatchery practices, but in that suite of actions, uh, the federal government said for Snake River stock, it's essential that the four lower snake dams um, are breached and that you restore that river if you're going to achieve healthy and harvestable stocks again. So what's the reaction of different communities to that assessment of limiting factors in the dire straits of, of salmon? Well, six sovereigns uh, in the Pacific Northwest, including the Nez Perce tribe and three other treaty tribes, the states of Oregon and Washington, got together in the last year and developed a Columbia Basin Restoration Initiative. It, it really set a roadmap or a vision um, with some, some kind of key attributes to achieve that you know, we're going we're gonna to take lots of perspectives into account, we're going to meet our tribal uh, mandates, and we're going to achieve healthy and abundant fish is, is the outcome. The federal government responded to that Columbia Basin Restoration Initiative and some legal actions, and President Biden, September of 2023, issued a, a memorandum that said the whole of the U.S. government would be behind getting to healthy and harvestable stocks. There were two other documents, a United States Commitments documents and a memorandum of understanding about steps that would actually be, and resources that would be put in place to restore healthy and abundant. Uh, that document can be found uh, at this website. I'm not gonna go into great details of it, um, but it is at the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission's uh, website. In that document, there are a number of different categories, uh, and I'm not gonna take the time to go through this, uh, each one of these. It is extensive uh, in terms of at least the steps to consider what it's going to take to achieve healthy and harvestable. I'm going to highlight four things that are really key and high profile. One in that commitment is that there is a, uh, a commitment to help tribes develop some energy sovereignty because the hydro system is a, is a big part hydro system driven and power driven. The tribes have been left out and impacted by that. Probably the most significant portion is the second, second bullet, and that is to analyze how to replace the services, and that's plural, um, if the four lower snake dams are authorized to be breached. And, and it's going to take an authorization from Congress uh, to take those four dams out. Um, but it is looking at what it's gonna take to keep those other services, hydropower, uh, water supply for irrigation and flood control, navigation purposes and recreation uh, to, to keep com communities whole and, and not just um, uh, be negatively impacted. I won't talk about these other ones unless folks have, have questions. So what's the needed response for, from, from others? This, this is all done in the context of meeting treaty rights and ecological restoration and keeping salmon, which the Pacific Northwest is known for, from going extinct and being robust once again. It happens to coincide with a period where energy resources and demand are becoming inadequate and there needs to be a doubling of energy generation in the Pacific Northwest just to keep people's lights on. Those four dams supply less than 2% of the existing power. So if the Pacific Northwest has to, to generate 30,000 more megawatts in the next 20 years, and the four lower snake dams supply about 1,000, it seems like planning for meeting the energy need 
of 30,000 megawatts is, can be done in a way to build 31,000 and do it in a way that work for salmon. So we need to tr transform that Pacific Northwest energy. In the meantime, we need to continue to protect and restore the in-stream habitat and flows that will be resilient to climate change impacts and essential to, to um, uh, keeping the productivity of those salmon uh, high and, and, and robust or resilient to climate change impacts. And then finally, um, we need to authorize and support and, and convince uh, congressional members, members that authorization of breaching the four lower snake dams is necessary. So I'm gonna stop there and see if we have time for questions. Thank you, Jay. And I'm going to ask, uh, there were a couple questions that came in from Roger Wheeler. So, Roger? Yes. <laughs> there. Let me yeah. see. Yeah, the, I can read them. I just thought okay. you would. I'm what trying to get back to my chat. I just had it. Okay. I don't have my glasses. I typed it. So go ahead and read them, Becky, okay. if you would. Wouldn't all the fish nutrients transferred to the land be very, very beneficial uh, to the growth of forest and CO2 removal from the atmosphere? Uh, if they were, if they returned up the river is what I assume you mean. Yeah, they're going to die. All, and then that, or all the uh, nutrients then are consumed and then transferred away from the river into the forest. Uh, at probably good distances, you know. Yep. Um, there are signatures of marine drive nutrients uh, in the trees and uh, soil um, profiles um, really from the ridge tops all the way down to the riparian zone. And um, that nutrient cycling has been essentially broken uh, with the low numbers of fish. So when we think about restoration, it's really important to think about things greater than just the human opportunity to harvest. You are totally right that this will be an ecological shift um, back to producing, you know, robust um, ridge top to ridge top um, terrestrial production, both both uh, flora and fauna that will reduce carbon, I believe. I had another question too. I think I read it. Uh, is any attention given to the fact, and I, I sort of took this, I can't remember the study, Saanich Inlet comes to mind in British Columbia. If the river ran wild with the millions of fish in the estuaries, it would draw larger ground fish, you know, that they, the, they, they don't come up the river, but they would feed on the one and address fish who would stir up the bottom and release nutrients like nitrogen and silica, which would promote diatom growth. And that would help the marine ecosystem and sequester carbon CO2 permanently. I don't know if that's, if, if any attention, anyone knows this or uh, in, in, as a reason to get rid of these dams. I mean, it's the, uh, yeah. Another reason. <laughs> I, I really like your holistic thinking and, and that those types of connections are involved in some of the discussions and life cycle modeling that, that is being done. I'm sure we haven't connected all of those dots and, and uh, the ones that you ha highlighted there, um, um, at least for the area I'm not familiar with. We have in the in the Columbia Basin talked about how uh, the higher um, productivity from marine dri derived nutrients in the tributary habitat will change ecosystems, but there will still be four dams uh, in the lower Columbia that will really filter out the large woody debris and then slow water velocity. So a lot of that sediment and the nutrients associated with that still will not reach the estuary and, and Pacific Ocean. So, um, Prob removing the four snake dams may help that a little bit, but there's still four four reservoirs and um, uh, let's see, 200 miles of reservoir that that will still filter that sediment out. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Because uh, we're gonna we're, we're ready about ready to move to uh, to Meg Sheehan. So. Cliff? Very quick question. I appreciate your, your effort for us there, Jay. Um, 
Has there been any studies to determine what percentage or of nutrition uh, sea run species require from the ocean compared to inland? What percentage of their life is spent in the ocean? Because I think it would be important because we know that they do spend some time in the ocean and maybe the ocean is lacking what they need. Any studies? Uh, so there are some very robust life cycle models uh, that are looking at the limiting factors uh, you know, for, for each one of these anadromous stocks. And you're correct, um, well, uh, for, for these salmon returns that I've highlighted, spring, summer, Chinook in particular, uh, they spend anywhere from two to four years um, in, in the ocean uh, after spending about a year and a half in freshwater as a juvenile. So a year and a half in the freshwater, they leave the, the, the rivers um, at about five to six inches long, spend two to four years in the ocean and come back as you know, 10 to 30 pound fish. So the conditions in the ocean are really significant in terms of their survival and the numbers of fish coming back. And we, we do have models that show ocean productivity influences uh, on those, those factors and they're substantial. Um, the freshwater environment also has a substantial influence and so getting the most juveniles to the ocean and juveniles in the healthiest condition possible is really our focus given the dynamic uh, conditions that are now persistent in the, um, you know, the Pacific Ocean uh, and the Pacific Rim area. Um, so it is something that we are aware of and those are influenced by a number of factors, climate change and the temperatures, uh, there, there's been a condition prevalent in the last few years called the blob. It's high, the high surface temperatures. Uh, so the scientists came up with a catchy name called the blob. And, and those conditions have been really hard for steelhead in particular. Um, and we look at other factors, the effects of hatchery uh, releases and competition for the, the, the changed you know, diatom all the way up through you know, changed predators that are in the ocean and and, and different predators being there. So we're not trying to overlook that. We're learning lots about it um, and taking that into account. And we understand that there's a, uh, you know, an interactive effect between the freshwater environment and the saltwater productivity. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much. And we're gonna turn now to Meg Sheehan, who's back with us, already yeah. having been having been introduced, so Meg? Sure, thanks so much for having me and I appreciate, for, I mean, I apologize for being late. I don't know if you wanna have my slides going in the background, but feel free. Um, I was asked to speak about highlights of the past decade of activism, activism around megadams. So I'll be talking about the North American megadam Resistance Alliance, which grew out of a grassroots network that was nascent here in the Northeast of the US that had come together in the 1980s. And this is my understanding of it. So anyone else who's on the call here can check in and confirm or deny what I'm saying. But um, that had come together to stop one of the Canadian dams on the Hudson Bay, the Cree people had put together, uh, built a canoe and canoed down the Hudson River down to New York City. This was the journey of the Odiac. And it was the Cree people who made it all the way down to lower Manhattan where they had the band, the j dam jam. And it was such a huge success that the mayor canceled the contract. I see, I'm, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, so they canceled the contract and that was the delivery of hydropower to New York City. And the network was still loosely together. And I connected originally with Roberta from Grand River Keeper, who I believe is on the call. I got involved because I had been working on 
uh, opposing and shutting down a nuclear power plant in my hometown in Plymouth, Massachusetts on Cape Cod Bay that had withdrawn billion, half a billion gallons a day of um, Cape Cod seawater into the once cool through once through cooling water system. And of course with it, um, fish and uh, all, all kinds of like the migratory herring that you're talking about and the larva and whatnot. We looked um, at what was going to be replacing the nuclear power and it was a subsea cable to Plymouth, Massachusetts, coming from Eastern Canada. So I think my friend Pine Dubois is on the call here. We started connecting the dots and checking around to see where this power would be coming from. And we found that there was some resistance up in Labrador to the construction of a new dam, a mega dam on the Churchill River on the lower Churchill called Muskrat Falls. So we ended up connecting with the Labrador land protectors, the Grand Riverkeeper Labrador, who had been fighting this dam on the lower Churchill. And things just grew from there. And we connected with the people in Maine who were concerned about the central Maine power. We were calling it the power cord through Maine to Massachusetts to bring Canadian hydropower down from Canada to Massachusetts, of course, calling it clean and green. That was a project by Iberdrola, I believe. Then we started looking uh, about the, at the cable to deliver this hydropower down to New York City. This was the Champlain Hudson Power Express, a Blackstone project. Um, that would put a subsea uh, underwater cable underneath the Lake Champlain crossing the border just south of Montreal. And, and I see Annie's on here. She can connect me, correct some of my geographical and chronological uh, misstatements, but um, that would be coming under Lake Champlain through the, the, under the Hudson River. We connected with the Center for Biological Diversity to try to protect the sturgeon, this was endangered species habitat for the sturgeon in the river. Um, they were going to be doing this horizontal drilling through the bedrock, but we didn't have much luck from what I understand there. They are laying the cable at this time under Lake Champlain uh, coming across the border in New York, I believe. So we started looking at the other lines crisscrossing the US, as you can see on the map here, we ended up connecting with folks in Manitoba who were opposing the, uh, the devastating operation of some of the dams in Manitoba um, and the people in Pemichicamac and Cross Lake. And then we kept going and we connected with the people who were working to oppose the Site C Dam in British Columbia. So these were all new dams, mega dams that were being proposed for construction to supply electricity, mostly uh, to the Midwest in the U.S. and the Northeast. So we did all kinds of activist things. We did tours with some of the Indigenous people from Manitoba who were impacted by the Manitoba Dam. We um, went to events. We went to Boston, New York. We did talks at all different locations. We did webinars and outreach. We have kept uh, up the campaign in New York City to try to prevent the city from buying RECs or renewable energy credits that would be coming from Chippy. And we're really trying to have a an environmental justice lens on it and focusing on how indigenous lands in Canada have been exploited for many, many years, decades uh, by Canadian Hydro, which is basically a state owned monopoly. And um, one of the most compelling stories I think is a book that Joan Sachs referred me to, which is Strangers in the Land. And it talks about the indigenous people and their experience with um, the Canadian Hydro companies in Quebec 
our company and how they were surveying the land and finding ways to dam up every little stream and river and divert it into one of these big hydropower operations. So we did everything we could, we felt, to try to raise awareness um, around the same time, probably in like 2014 in Canada, there was an effort at the University of Winnipeg to um, help Indigenous communities deal with the impacts of hydropower. And that is still going on. It's called Waniskatan. And they formed an international uh, group to raise awareness and connect with Indigenous folks internationally working on dams called Dam Watch International. And we did webinars with folks from Brazil and really all over the world to try to raise awareness about this. And of course, try to connect with international rivers and other groups. We made a short film that should be still out there on YouTube somewhere. Um, when we were in Maine, it's uh, with the Pema Chickamack people talking about the sacredness of the river. And that was a really powerful film. We went over the impacts of, um, you know, the, the methylmercury that uh, concentrates in the water as a result of the flooding of the forest and the impacts on that, on the indigenous people's food and the, the Harvard study that showed that damming these new rivers in Canada and the Eastern Canada would raise the methylmercury levels in the indigenous people to levels that exceeded the health standards for the United States. Um, so that's where we, what we did. And we eventually um, tried to transition to a group called Save the World's Rivers. I understand you're having Gary um, Walkner speak on one of the next webinars. So we have tried to network and, and raise, the, raise the level of awareness throughout North America and globally. And I've, it's just been a great uh, privilege and honor for me to work with this group. And thanks for the opportunity to circle back and reminisce. Thank you, Meg. Are there questions for Meg Sheehan? I believe Cl uh, Cliff has one. Yes. Hello, Meg, and thank you for making an appearance, finally. <laughs> Meg, I'm really sorry. Um, I bet you've had a long day. Are you aware that almost 90% of these river, of the rivers that are being mega dammed in Canada, almost 90% of the water is held for six months impounded in the summertime at the exact time the nutrients are required by marine life in the ocean, they're being held and detained. All the spring melt is is being dropped behind the dams. Are you aware of that? I think I was. I think I read about this in a book, uh, Roger's book or someone's book. Yeah, I mean, the practices um, that are involved, the creation and all these huge reservoirs and storage of the water is, yeah, devastating. Thank you. Thank Just you. Just wanted to be sure you knew the full picture. Yeah. Okay, we've got Roberta. You have to unmute Roberta. Okay, um, I know you can't see me because I'm sitting in a really funny spot within the house. But anyway, hi, Meg. So good hi, to see you. Hi, Roberta. I know. How are Same you? Here. I, <laughs> I just wanted you to know that, um, and this is another part of the story for the folks that are on that, that didn't go through all of this with us. Um, you know, our visit to um, Mueniskatan Conference Mm -hmm. And we started that Dam Watch International group. They now have the, the website up. Uh, we had an anonymous donor come forward not long ago 
uh, with some money for us to work on that database. Remember the oh, database? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it is currently a, a close to one half uh, completely revamped. And hopefully by the end of this year, and I've said that three years in a row now, uh, that is going to be in good condition and will be put on the uh, Dam Watch International website with all kinds of impacts of, of hydro. But since uh, Steve Kasprzak and Roger, uh, the books that Steve has written and Roger's work with him, um, we've had a, a whole new category added with all of the Arctic impacts. And uh, frankly, um, it, it is looking like a lot of the impacts in the Arctic from dams are pretty serious and need we need scientific groups, uh, uh, climate change groups to come on board to kind of help us get all of that um, scientific reviews done on all of these um, documents that we have and try to get the scientific community to start saying hydro projects are a part of the problem and we have to include them. So I just wanted you to be aware of that because I know you were around when we when we started. Well, yeah, you were around. You were on that steering committee with me. God, we've been around, round, round, girl. <laughs> I know, but it's exciting to hear. And I, I was thinking today, I know that our NAMRA website is no longer, but I have a lot of documents that I'd be happy to share. I would love to have someone somewhere to put them. And so if you want to connect with me, and I yep. was also reminded about how we did the study with, um, I'm forgetting the name of the bill, the consultant in Montreal about whether Canada had enough uh, hydropower without building new dams to supply all of these transmission corridors to the U.S. And the conclusion was um, no, that there wasn't enough without building new dams. And from what I understand, that's kind of coming true that Quebec yes. at least is saying they don't have enough power to export. And now they're blaming it all on EVs. Yeah. And what, right? So, right. yeah. So I just want to ask if anyone else has a question or a comment for Meg Sheehan, or at this point, I'm going to open it up to everyone. If anyone has a question or comment for any of our speakers, uh, Dan or Jay or Meg, or something else they would like to add to the discussion here. Yes, this is Annie Wilson, and thank you, Meg, for all that you contributed to this movement. And I believe that it will continue to grow. There are many people that want to protect rivers more and more. And so the foundation of the science has been delivered. Dams are coming down. People understand that we need our rivers. And um, over here in New York, we're losing our protection of the so-called Hudson River, but there might be a second wind that might somehow complicate things for Blackstone, the developers, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And in Quebec, in fact, there is not enough power. And industry is very upset about the exports that were planned for the Northeast. And there are folks up there that have stated that it would be an embarrassment for the Quebec government to back out of their contracts with New York, but they really do need the power up there. And they will probably not be building new dams, although they're going very full tilt on so-called upgrading a lot of the facilities to produce more power. There is a, a secret review that hasn't been published of potential sites. And in the meantime, they're looking to build a lot of wind very fast. Okay. So that's the situation. Thank you, Andy. As I see Joan, it. go ahead, Joan. Thank you. You'll have to unmute. Joan, you'll have to unmute. Well, I'd like to ask Dan and Jay what 
what the next process is. What can we do in terms of the Penobscot FERC and also <clears throat> more explicitly, and also Jay, what is the next step regarding the snake breaching? <clears throat> Do we ask our congressmen and ladies or? Dan, you wanna go first? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, it, the, the West Branch of the Penobscot is kind of in the, um, the stage where various studies have been required. Um, that will all be sort of synthesized and there will be an opportunity to comment on some of those documents. And then ultimately there'll be like the 401 certificate, water quality certification and a draft EIS, environmental impact statement that'll be done on those. And so um, as that moves forward, I can, if I have the, uh, a, who should, who should I contact to, to kind of, plug people into that, that would be really helpful to know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Jay. Uh, there are several processes that are ongoing, but um, I, I think certainly discussions with your elected officials uh, to start to inform them about the importance of salmon and reminding them of that. I guess I've become jaded that that's not enough of a, a hook usually to uh, change their minds uh, based off of the influences of of the economic world, uh, even though there is a strong economic benefit to having healthy and abundant salmon. Um, the other sectors, I think, have the ears of our elected officials. So I would recommend that you engage with those representatives, uh, regardless of where you are at in the uh, country, uh, about the sufficiency of energy and the necessity to develop new energy uh, sources that are low carbon emissions and um, done in a way that are compatible with healthy and harvestable fish. And, and so they're gonna have to respond and be helpful on the energy front. And then highlighting for the Pacific Northwest, the, those four snake dams, um, are not clean energy when you take into consideration the impacts that they have on fish. And it's a small part of the change that's needed. So, so that is one in terms of a, a communication with, with local folks, because it is gonna be a congressional act eventually. And we're hoping to get that, that decision um, you know, as soon as possible. Uh, right now, the, the, the congressional alignment is not there, but we're hoping for some changes after the studies about how you would do this come forth. There are also some ongoing FERC relicensing efforts specific to the Hell's Canyon complex mm -hmm. uh, that will be starting um, here probably in the next three to four months. So if you like to comment on FERC processes, that is one that can at least account for some of the water shaping that comes down the Snake River Basin and down through the Lower Snake complex. Uh, those, are, those are probably two of the biggies um, but ultimately, this comes down to a, a congressional decision to take those four dams out and do it in a way that supports communities and changes them in a way. You know, those dams were built on the backs of salmon and the salmon can't change anymore. So we have to change it in a way that works for salmon and uh, do it in a way that helps farmers and irrigators and energy development stay functional. Thank you, Jay. I have Jonathan and then Cliff. I think mine might have been answered in the chat, but I was just wondering about the status of the Gull Island Dam up in Labrador and other threats um, in the Northeast. I, I might uh, want to try to answer that the best I can. And I guess you know, Jonathan, that uh, our government's um, do a lot of secret talking and uh, they don't they don't tell us until they've made up their minds what they're going to do but um, I think Annie said a little while ago that uh, yes they need more power in Quebec there's no question and uh, we always knew that we said it from day one but you know they they kind of lied their way through that to get uh, 
to get New York and Boston on side. But they are discussing behind closed doors about Gull Island. We don't know what they're having to say, but uh, we think it's going to hit. And when it hits, it's going to hit hard. And I did put a message in the chat about the fact that you folks down there have this relicensing thing, even if it's every 30 years. I mean, we've got dams up here that, that have been ongoing since the 1960s, late 60s. So, you know, if and, and things change and we know all these new things about the impacts of these dams. And yet we have no recourse in Canada to go back to the federal government and say, man, oh man, you know, we've learned all of this since since you built these dams. So let's go back and reassess. So I'm just wondering if folks, uh, folks that uh, Dan and, and uh, oh, I can't remember the other phone's name Jay. right now. Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> uh, if, if there's some recommendations you could give us about how, how we might proceed to convince the federal government in Canada. Now that's yeah, that's like trying to say. Anyway, never mind. Talk about yeah. Jaden. Right. Talk it's about Jaden. It's pretty clear that uh, that a lot of the action around the dams is you know needs to happen in Canada as much as in the U.S. Yes. Yes. And so. More so. Right. More so. Okay. I mean, at least the EPA is now <laughs> recommending that all the dams have to uh, report their greenhouse gases. I mean, there's no way right. in God's green earth Canadians will, Canadian yeah. government will ever go right. along with it, right? Okay, Roberta, I'm going to turn to Cliff now. Yep. Uh, and Becky's in the queue also. Yes. I wanted to say to Jay and Dan and uh, Megan, particularly Jay and, Dan, Jay and Dan, because they spent a lot of time about the health of sea run fish, which is very important for tribal people, both on the East and the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the map real carefully, I want you to keep one thing in mind. Determine the flow of the currents coming out of the Arctic Ocean. From Siberia to Labrador, there are literally hundreds of dams mostly in the subarctic. Some major dams on the Kara Sea, which affect the Pacific coast, they're there trapping so much nutrition, it's mind boggling. And I know it seems out of your, sort of out of your reach to have to deal with that, but we do have to keep Canada in our sights. And one way to do it possibly is to get the fishermen on board in the US and Canada because they're hurting too. The nutritional element is a key one. As you said, Jay, those fish are little tiny fries go out to the ocean and few of them and few of them are coming back because they're not getting the nutrition they used to get. Right, very so just good keep, point. keep that in mind. Good, thank you, Cliff. All right, Becky. I just well, I wanted to ask Meg about the um, rights of rivers, and I Andy Burt is on the call, who's been trying to look at the rights of nature here in Maine with the Pine Tree Amendment. I just wonder if you know you can fill us in on how that's going and how we can relate to that. I'm really not up on it, but I know that the only two rivers that I know of that have rights at this point are one in New Zealand and one in Canada. I think Andy knows the name, but it was in our Hoodwink in the Hot House uh, chapter. So I'm sorry, I don't have anything to offer more than that. Okay. Anyone else? Eve Vogel, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if any of you uh, are familiar with Eve Vogel, but she's at the University of Massachusetts. And she's a scientist. Tell them a little bit about your background, Eve, please. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm connecting to many of the presentations tonight. Um, I did my dissertation on the Columbia Basin, a long-term history of the Bonneville Power Administration, and looked at <laughs> the, the interrelationship between energy and fish and wildlife. Um, and then I moved here, and I've been working on 
Connecticut River Relicensing and also did a paper on the legacies of electric power restructuring in New England and how that has shaped Massachusetts effort to import Hydro-Quebec power. So uh, yeah, many of these conversations are, are things that I've touched on in various ways. It's pretty amazing to um, see all of you uh, making the kinds of connections that I feel like I've sort of um, been making um, without a lot of other people knowing about these different systems. So it's kind of neat. I don't know. Yeah, so I could, I could say lots, but I don't know. You're covering a lot of information too. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks. The, I was I was writing to Pine because the um <laughs> the Connecticut River relicensing is happening right now, um and it's very active. Um, the, the you know we're at the end of like a 12, 13 year process of relicensing, and right now the three states are doing their water quality certification process. So that's the big deal that um the Connecticut River Conservancy and others are asking people to weigh in on. I've been following Massachusetts energy policy because it has the po the potential to indirectly affect what happens in a lot of hydropower. Um, and that connection is not always made between state level, supposedly clean energy policy and the effects on rivers. So in, right. in the Northwest, fortunately, that connection is usually made between the interactions between what happens in energy and hydropower and ecology and fish and wildlife, even if it's negative, at least people are paying attention. In New England, they are often not even making those connections. So that's part of what I am trying to work on these days. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Thank you, Eve. Um, yeah. Lee, Lee Goff has Could you please a... provide your information? And um, it'll be very interesting to see, read your comments and your research yep. that you've already That'd be great. developed. Thank you. Okay. Absolutely. We are running out of time here. We're at the end of our time, uh, actually. So um, I wanted to thank the speakers for your presentations, for your time, for all of your efforts. Thank you to everyone who's come on this evening. I hope that uh, you'll join us again next month. October 22nd is our second webinar in this three webinar series. It'll be at the same time this was tonight. Um, if you want more information, you can you can reach us through uh, the Sierra Club, the main chapter, or uh, directly through the NECAPA group. Which maybe uh, Becky, you could put that in the in the chat. NECAPA dot me at gmail dot com is our is our email address, and we welcome your more direct involvement. It seems to me I'm a newbie in this that um, NECAPA is, is uh, a grandchild of NAMRA or some other incarnation of it uh, continuing that work. So um, I look forward to NECAPA.ME. Uh, Oopsie, sorry. Okay. Also, also want to mention briefly that you can look into more information on NECAPA's website, hydrodamtruth.org. Right, Hydro Dam Truth. I think we should have a website just to give the list of all the websites that we need to be looking at. <laughs> okay. So with that, I'm going to say thank you to all. Any final comments from anybody before we say good night to you all? I would love to say just thanks for everybody being on board and and being involved. And it's like 15 years ago. Um, our group had a meeting, uh, the land protectors and Grand River Keeper, and they all said, mm -hmm. well, what are you going to work on? And I said, international connections. And by George, we got them. We got them. And I'm so pleased to see everybody Thanks. on this call. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, everybody. you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Really a pleasure. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.